series on hope. Chapter 37, verses 1 through 11. Now Jacob lived in the land where his father had sojourned in the land of Canaan. These are the records of the generations of Jacob. Joseph, when 17 years of age, was pasturing the flock with his brothers while he was still a youth. Along with the sons of Bilhah, the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought back a bad report about them to their father. Now Israel, meaning Jacob, loved Joseph more than all his sons, because he was the son of his old age, and he made him a very colored tunic. His brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, and so they hated him and could not speak to him on friendly terms. Then Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. He said to them, Please listen to this dream which I have had. For behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and lo, my sheep ro sheaf rose up and also stood erect. And behold, your sheaves gathered around and bowed down to my sheaf. Then his brother said to him, Are you actually going to reign over us? Or are you really going to rule over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. Now he had still another dream and related it to his brothers and said, Lo, I've had still another dream. And behold, the sun and the moon and eleven stars were bowing down to me. He related it to his father and to his brothers. And his father rebuked him and said to him, What is this dream that you have had? Shall I and your mother and your brothers actually come to bow ourselves down before you to the ground? His brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the saying in mind. Now would you say that this was a functional or a dysfunctional family? I always find it interesting that this is one of the families that's in the direct line of the Messiah. But we also see that there was a tremendous amount of growth and development in terms of their spiritual walk. And that's important for us today because it's in this situation where we see hope at work. When my dad was on the road for Sam's night luggage, he worked for them for years. In a couple of three years, he was on the road. He had Kansas, part of Nebraska, and eastern Colorado for his territory. And he didn't like being away from home from the family. So when he was coming home, it seemed just about the time he was at the Colorado line, maybe around Goodland, Kansas, somewhere around there, he'd make a long distance call. And he'd say, I'm coming home and I'll be there in so many hours. Now he had at that time a brand new Chevy and as many times as I rode with him, he could never get that thing to go more than 96 miles an hour. But I also know this, I was at least old enough to figure out how much time it would take to get from Goodland to Denver. I don't think he kept the speed limit. But this was all right for us because we had hope. Dad had called and he's on the way. And he usually did it at night so that all of a sudden my sister couldn't go to sleep. And it took me a little bit longer as well. But there was hope. Dad said he was coming. And there were always hugs and we're always glad to see Dad because Dad always brought a present to him at home. And so we looked forward to Dad, but we also looked forward to what he had in his hand as well. But notice it's hope. The hope is that we were assured that Dad was going to come. It never crossed our minds that he could never make it home, that there'd be an accident of sorts, but this is what hope is about. It is something that we hold to be true. It's something that we hold to be certain. And the certainty comes from the one who gives the promise. Faith for us is putting our trust in a person, Jesus Christ. And our hope is found in the promises that he gives. His promises are as good as his word. And this is why it's important that you and I understand that we should be people of hope. And if we are truly people of hope, aha, we will be 
people of faith as well. But notice here we've opened up this message with a statement that God alone is the source of hope. And he is the major agent in bringing hope to mankind. A loosely translated passage from one of the Psalms states that the hope of man goes with him to the grave and there is nothing. But the hope that we have in Jesus Christ, the resurrected, ascended, reigning, and returning Lord is sufficient. And he is the major agent in bringing hope to mankind. But notice that he uses his people to be agents of hope to others. And the life of Joseph reveals these truths. And one of the things that I hope that we are seeing through this series, because I've deliberately picked biographies to explain and to hold before us hope. Notice that in order to be a person of hope, you must find yourself in a hopeless position. And that is a part of life. And that's how it really goes. And we see that in the life of Joseph as he reveals these truths. Joseph knew the hardships of life and Joseph knew the blessings of God. And of course, there he was, something of an arrogant teenager walking around saying, nanner, 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 God, my daddy loves me best. He created a lot of his own problems, didn't he? But here he was, a 17-year-old, and some, by some 10 years later, we can see some tremendous amount of growth in that young man's life. And it was definitely hardship that he finally had to deal with. Joseph, now Israel, loved Joseph more than all of his sons because he was the son of his old age and he made him a very colored tunic. His brothers saw that their father loved him more than all of his brothers and so they hated him and could not speak to him on friendly terms. Notice that even though he may have been the cause of some of it, he wasn't the cause of all of it, but he indeed was the object of hatred. He knew what hatred was about he knew what jealousy was about because his brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the saying in mind, meaning that second dream where all of a sudden the moon and the sun have to bow down along with 11 stars. But he knew jealousy and notice as well, he, know, he experienced violence from his own family. They said to one another, here comes this dreamer. Now then come and let us kill him and throw him into one of the pits and we will say a wild beast devoured him. Then let us see what will become of his dreams. Notice what hatred does. Notice what jealousy does. The brothers were absolutely consistent in what they were going to do to Joseph. But instead, Judah steps in, and it not only is reduced from violence, but it still is nothing but betrayal. And Judah said to his brothers, What profit is it for us to kill our brother and cover up his blood? Come and let us sell him to the Ishmaelites, and not to lay our hands on him, for he is our brother, our own flesh, and his brothers listened to him. All of a sudden, reason seems to begin to be seen within the family dynamics. But notice what's really interesting to me. Judah asked the question, what profit is it for us to kill our brother? And now they're going to find some profit as they sell him into slavery. But he didn't realize the profit that would be his because of his brother by some decade later. And so they listened to him and they sold him into slavery. And some of the Midianite traders passed by. So they pulled him up and lifted Joseph out of the pit and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 shekels of silver. And thus they brought Joseph into Egypt. And notice the false accusation. By the time we read verses 16 through 18 of chapter 39, Joseph has been a slave to Potiphar, who is the keeper of the prison. And notice, he's in, so she left, meaning Potiphar's wife, she left her garment beside her until his master came home. And then she spoke to him with these words. The Hebrew slave whom you brought to us came in to me to make sport of me. 
And I raised my voice and screamed, and he left his garment beside me and fled outside. Notice that Joseph made no defense of himself, and notice that he had to be the object of a false accusation, and therefore the prison imprisonment itself was false. Now when his master heard the words of his wife, which she spoke to him, saying, This is what your slave did to me, his anger burned. So Joseph's master took him and put him into the jail, the place where the king's prisoners were confined, and he was there in jail. Some of the commentators seem to think that even though uh, Potiphar was angry, that usually a slave like that would be executed. So the question is, did, she, did he really believe his wife altogether, or was it just so much that he had some respect for Joseph that he would put him in prison instead of execute him. But notice what we're looking at. We're looking at enslavement, false accusation, false imprisonment, nothing but jealousy and hatred. Here is a part of his environment in which he lived. And then after he's in prison for a while, remember that you had the cup bearer and the baker, and both of them had dreams, and the dreams were, were interpreted by Joseph and one was going to die and the other was going to live. And the cupbearer was the one who lived and he was reinstated into his position. And before he left, Joseph asked him to say a good word for him. But notice that the chief cupbearer did not remember Joseph, but forgot him. Now then, this is what we have seen for the social and the existential, the personal environment of Joseph. Yes, he brought on a lot of these problems himself. There's no doubt about that. But notice that others were every bit as unethical and even immoral as Joseph ever could be. Joseph begins to shine like a light even in his weakest moment of his braggadocious ways as a teenager. But he knew the hardships of life. Now notice this is important for you and me. Because I'm going to imagine, I'm going to guess, that by this time in our lives, we've all gone through some really dark times. We've gone through some times that have been hurtful. And we've been asking ourselves and asking the Lord, what did I do to deserve this? And this is always a question that should be slowly asked, if at all. Because when we say, what did I do to deserve this? The question then follows, what do I deserve? And if our salvation is by grace alone, then we should keep that distinction in mind. But at any rate, we find that he was in a position where, as a believer, there was no way out, at least for 10 years. There's no way out. And Joseph knew, though, the blessings of God. And this is what I hope that we pick up during this series, is that sometimes to be the blessing, we have to be in the position of hardship, we have to be in the situation of suffering and of trials and tribulations. Now, understand that I'm going against some of the wise counsel of preachers who say you don't preach on suffering, you don't preach on tribulation, unless, of course, it's pre, mid, or post. But we, if we're going to face life as we've had to, and if we're going to face life as it comes to us, we must understand that there's still hardships Involved, and some of you are going through those things right now. But this is where the blessings of God were found. Because notice that the very outset, the Lord was with Joseph. And because the Lord was with Joseph, he became a successful man. He became a successful man in the house of his master, the Egyptian. And we've already seen what took place there that had him unseated. But the blessings included success, but notice that the blessing did not include freedom. The blessing did not include the fact that Joseph would be set free and could go back home to his people and to his family. And the thing that Joseph wanted the most was the thing that Joseph did not get right away. He was a blessing, and he was a blessing. He received blessings, but he did not have his freedom. And notice then as well. Now his master saw that the Lord was with him, 
and how the Lord caused all that he did to prosper in his land. This is the blessing. But notice what happens along the way. And it came about at the time that he had made him an overseer in his house and over all that he owned, the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house on account of Joseph. And thus the Lord's blessing was upon all that he owned in the house and in the field. The blessing that came to Potiphar because of Joseph was clear, and he understood it most clearly. And he interpreted the dream eventually when we come to page 3 that disappeared on me. Joseph Master recognized him and noticed that Potiphar was blessed by God. So even in this time of trial and tribulation for him, there was also a blessing to those who were around him, and that blessing was a witness and a testimony to the presence of God and the goodness of God. And so we see then that it came about that from the time that he made him overseer in his house and over all that he owned, the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house on account of Joseph. And thus the Lord's blessing was upon all that he owned in the house and in the field. The question that I found myself asking this time and on other passages in the scripture over the years, am I willing to be able to go through hard times in order to be a blessing to someone else? Do I ask God to get me out of the difficulty so that I don't have to face the hard times and perhaps somebody would not receive the witness and the testimony that God could use in and through my life? That's the question to be asked. And notice that God blessed Joseph, the prisoner. But the Lord was with Joseph and extended kindness to him and gave him favor in the sight of the chief jailer. And the chief jailer committed to Joseph's charge all the prisoners who were in the jail so that whatever was done there, he was responsible for it. This is an interesting passage because now we've gone to Potiphar's house and Potiphar's been blessed. He's in charge of the king's prison. And if Joseph was thrown into that prison, Potiphar had to know what was going on with Joseph. And so it seems to me that the Lord's hand was still around Joseph because as he was in jail he noticed that the jailer saw what a good man Joseph was and so whatever that was done there Joseph was responsible for it. Here he is caught as a slave. Notice that the slave became a blessing to the first master and the slave became a blessing to the jail keeper along the way. And notice that once again that there was prosperity as we see here, the chief jailer did not supervise anything under Joseph's charge because the Lord was with him, and whatever he did, the Lord made to prosper. All along the way, people are being touched by the grace of God. We notice the term common grace as well as saving grace. And what we see is that Joseph was a witness and a testimony to those who were around him. Egypt knew the blessing of God because of Joseph. And notice then Pharaoh sent and called for Joseph. And they hurriedly brought him out of the dungeon. And when he had shaved himself and changed his clothes, he came to Pharaoh. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, I have had a dream, but no one can interpret it. And I have heard it said about you that when you hear a dream, you can interpret it. Notice here, all of a sudden, the word comes to Pharaoh that there is one who can interpret that dream. And so he was called before Pharaoh, and they hurriedly brought him out of the dungeon, and when he had shaved himself and changed his clothes, he came to Pharaoh. And he was given the responsibility to interpret the dream. And that was the dream of seven years of abundance and then seven years of harsh times. And he interpreted that dream, and he proposed the plan. Now as for the repeating of the dream to Pharaoh twice, it means that the matter is determined by God, and God will quickly bring it about. And now let Pharaoh look for a man discerning and wise, and let him set him over the land of Egypt, 
and let Pharaoh take action to appoint overseers in charge of the land. I've always enjoyed this particular passage. This is somewhat to the side, but by the time the seven tough years came, it was Joseph who bought up the land of all the citizens and gave it to Pharaoh. And so by the time the, the difficult times, the famine throughout the land was through, the king of Egypt owned all of the property except for the property of the priests. And I always wondered how that would fit in America and with our thoughts of freedom and government oversight and things like that. Just a little side, something that is probably of little interest except it still was of me. But notice that the people thanked him because it was they understood that Joseph was the one who provided the plan of action. And notice that Pharaoh also recognized that God was with Joseph. Then Pharaoh named Joseph Zaphonath Paneah, and he gave him Asenath, the daughter of Potiphera, priest of On, as his wife. And Joseph went forth over the land of Egypt. Notice what's so important here for us to keep in mind, that Pharaoh recognized that God was with Joseph, that Pharaoh recognized that God was speaking through Joseph. And so he gave him the name Zaphonath Panea. God speaks and notice, God lives. There is your clue for the hope. God speaks and he lives. And this is what Joseph was able to get across to the, actually the king of the land. And there was the message. There was the witness. There was the testimony. And notice that God had blessed Joseph and that blessing basically was shared with others. And God blessed Joseph the man. Now before the year of famine came, two sons were born to Joseph, whom Asenath, the daughter of Potiphar, priest of On, bore to him. He became a married man. He became a father. Joseph named the firstborn Manasseh, for he said, God has made me forget all my trouble and all my father's household. And he named the second Ephraim, for he said, God has made me fruitful in the land of my affliction. Step back and take a look at what is being said here. Notice that Manasseh compensated for Joseph's troubles. Joseph named the firstborn Manasseh, for he said, God has made me forget all my trouble and all my father's household. Look at the other ones that we looked at. Look at Job. Look at Naomi. That they basically seem to have some harsh thoughts toward God. Now maybe Joseph did, but at least in this statement, notice God has made me forget all my trouble. I have gone through it, but now that I have this son, Manasseh, he's made me forget all my trouble, and he's made me forget my father's household. I'm a father. I have my own family. This is the gift of God. From where he started as a teenager to where he is now, probably in his late 20s, notice the way God has blessed him. And Ephraim reflected God's blessing in the midst of affliction, that God has made me fruitful in the land of my affliction. Here I have to live right in the affliction, in the hardship, but God still has blessed me, and God has made me fruitful. There is no one greater in this house than I, Joseph said to Potiphar's wife. And he has withheld nothing from me except you, because you are his wife. How then could I do this great evil and sin against God? Notice that at the very outset, when he ends, goes into his trials and troubles, when it looks like he's getting advanced and that he will soon be out of it, there is this attack upon his reputation. But notice that in spite of his troubles and his affliction, Joseph remained faithful. How then could I do this great evil and sin against God? It's important that we keep in mind that when we are in the middle of hardship and trial and suffering, God is still with us. There is not a time or a place or a situation where we are without God. And so when the temptation comes under the pressure, where is God? We need to remember that he is with us and we need to be with him by way of faith. And Joseph understood that God was working through him as well. So notice Pharaoh said to Joseph, I have had a dream, but no one can interpret it. 
And I have heard it said about you that when you hear a dream, you can interpret it. And Joseph then answered Pharaoh, saying, It is not in me. God will give Pharaoh a favorable answer. Two things. How could I sin against God? I serve him. I worship him. He is the one whose directions I follow. And then notice here, he says, Joseph answered Pharaoh, saying, It is not in me. God will give Pharaoh a favorable answer. The answer is in God. It may come to Pharaoh, but it will come to Pharaoh through me, but not from me. And there is the distinction. And Joseph understood that he was part of a larger plan. For when finally he meets his brothers and he reveals himself to his brothers, they were a bit shook up. You would be too, wouldn't you? If you were part of a plan to kill your brother and then a good thing happened, we got to sell him for a few shekels. Isn't that a good deal? And now all of a sudden, 10 years later, when you go down to Egypt to see if you can get enough food to survive, guess who you're talking to? It's your brother, but it's not the brother of the pit. It's the brother of the palace. And so Joseph sold, said to them, Do not be afraid. For I am in God, for am I in God's place? As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, in order to bring about this present result to preserve many people alive. The statement of hope at work. Notice, don't be afraid. Whatever you did, that's between you and God, not me. What a tremendous statement. If you were thrown in a pit and you heard the word that they're going to kill you, and then the next thing you know, they sell you into slavery, how, how many of us would basically say, hey, no big deal, that's between you and God. I'm just a side, I just stand on the side and watch it all. There is a real statement of faith and a statement of great strength. And notice the what else. As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring about this present result to preserve many people alive. Notice that the plan had to do with goodness. The plan had to do with life. The plan is the basis of a lasting hope. You had your intentions. You had your purposes. But God had an overriding one. With his power, he overrode your intents and your purposes and he turned your actions into something that is good. That the plan is the basis for lasting hope. Notice, but God meant it for good in order to bring about this present result to preserve many people alive. This is what hope is all about. Hope is all about making people alive in the, in the presence of doubts and fears that yet God is there. And you and I, if we go through hard times, we need to keep it in mind that God is still with us and he is working in us and through us and around us. Now then, notice this. It's very interesting. Peter was crucified upside down not too much longer after the, this epistle and the second one was written. But he says, after you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ will himself perfect, confirm, strengthen, and establish you after you have suffered a little while. Given the basic concept of hope as being an eager anticipation of what is promised, the question is, am I willing to endure the promised suffering in order to gain the promise of glory? Oftentimes, when we're talking about difficulties in a lighter mood, I always remind you of the book of Acts and Paul's statement, through many tribulations you must enter the kingdom. There are two things that happen. One, the end goal. You must enter the kingdom. Number two, the ways and the means, through many tribulations. This is the only way that it works, and we need to accept it, and notice what happens afterwards. That the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself perfect, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. The question is, am I willing to go through the hard times in order to come to the glory? And just as importantly, am I willing to suffer so that God will use me to bring others to him? 
I think that in the United States within the next 10 years and more, some of the hardships that we see our brothers and sisters going through in other places in the world will be a part of the experience of the Church of Jesus Christ. We may not be around to see it, but certainly our children and our grandchildren will. And they need to keep in mind what is being said here so long ago. And I would like to use this for a closing prayer. That we pray for one another and we use this verse. Join me as we read it. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Our Father, as we look at these passages, as we look at Joseph as the example, we see a very imperfect person. We see an imperfect family, imperfect brothers, imperfect father and mother. And yet you worked with these people and you used them to your glory. And we ask now that as just one of your many congregations, that we will be open, number one, to the hardships that we have to face, accept them as coming from you, that the God of old hope will fill us with joy and peace, peace in believing, that we may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. May this be our prayer for ourselves. May this be our prayer for each other. Use us to your glory now as we go our way. May we be people of hope for those whose situation seems hopeless. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.